We're on. All right. Hi, I'm Meg Weston, and I want to welcome all of you this afternoon or this evening if you're joining us from Europe. I am thrilled about this reading today. I'm very excited on the Poets' Corner. I see a lot of old friends and new friends here on the screen. As many of you know, the Poets' Corner was founded by myself and Catherine Seitz. Catherine, would you wave for us? <laughs> uh, to create and expand community around writers and readers of poetry and short prose. And um, so we invite people to read on the second Sunday of each month at this time zone. And we invite people who have some kind of connection to me. So today, our four poets reading are connected through our moderator, Mark Burroughs. Mark, would you wave and let people Hi. know who you are? Yeah. That's Thank great. you. Um, we're very lucky that Mark recently moved to Camden, Maine, and he was one of the poets reading on our very first reading back in June on the Poets' Corner. Uh, he was recently on the faculty of, in the university in Bochum, Germany, teaching religion and literature. He's a poet. Uh, and he's also an award-winning translator of poetry with several books of English translations of the poems of Rena Maria Wilke. And so Mark will be moderating the session, introducing the poets tonight, moderating some of the Q&A. Uh, feel free to put your comments in chat as we go along, and we'll try to keep our eye on that after the poets read and, and try to address some of your questions. And then sometime around five o'clock, we generally unmute the entire group and allow a little more free-flowing conversation, which we call cocktail conversation, whether or not you have a cocktail in hand. Um, so I just also wanted to mention that our next reading in November will be the New York poet, Kevin Pilkington, a very accomplished poet with, I believe, eight books of poetry, a novel, and more, reading with four poets that have studied with him at main media workshops in college <coughs> and who are also published poets in their own right. So don't miss signing up for, for the next meeting in November, but right now we're going to hear from people in England and Ireland, and I can't wait. So Mark, it's up to you. Thank you very much, Meg, and a warm welcome to all of you who are joining us from near and far. It's my pleasure to introduce uh, three poets I know quite well, and a fourth I'm, I've gotten to know through this um, reading. We're gonna begin tonight with Sarah Law, a poet who comes to us from London, where she teaches at the Open University, among other places. She has six collections of poetry out, most recently a book that just appeared a month ago, uh, inspired by the life and writings of witness of Therese of Lisieux. It's simply called Therese Poems, recently published by Paraclete Press. Sarah, a very warm welcome to you and lead us off now, thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mark. And I am absolutely delighted um, to be here. It's a um, Sunday evening here in the UK. Um, and um, I will be reading for a short while, about 12 minutes. Um, I have Mark to thank for many things and um, being here this evening is, is one of them. So it's, it's a great pleasure. Um, so um, I'm going to start by reading three short poems from um, a collect, well, it's more of a pamphlet than a full length collection, which um, came out a couple of years ago now. It's called My Converted Father. It came out with the UK press, uh, Broken Sleep books. Um, and I wrote them about the same time as I wrote my poems for Therese. Um, they, they were kind of a, an adjacent project. So, um, and they're not actually um, centered on religion. They're, they're more about memories. Well, they started off being memories of my father who, who um, we lost 
a lot, many years ago now. Um, and I suppose if anything, I've converted him into poetry <laughs> rather than anything else. So three short poems from, from this one. First one's called Morse. My converted father rings in my ear. It's Morse at a 15 kilohertz pitch. I hope you're keeping a log, he advises. I catch his aside, but can't translate the message. Can't tune into your station. I'll keep trying. I'm signalling from all over the world, he says. I got my licence lifetimes ago. I still know bits of the code. We should test each other. I had a little notebook, and when I waited outside the school gates, I'd peruse it. All the dots and dashes, dips and dars. More for the fun of learning something than deciphering its message. Yes, that's so often the case, he agrees. Now I'm converted into pure medium. Mm. Tai Chi. Mm. It's not a faith, you'd say. It's a martial art. Morning after morning, you'd be out on the patio, enacting your battle with enemy seconds. Every time you held a pose, white crane spreads wings. Eternity feathered your court form. As with any battle, you remind me, impetus, resistance comes from within. All this is a far cry from a puff of cloud, you add. A man must put his foot down eventually. Mm. And um, sitcom. Sometimes I'd hear you in the living room, watching late night comedy, laughing like a drain. I liked the funnies, says my converted father. Nothing too modern or lovey-dovey. Slip-ups, slapsticks and paranomasia. What was that last word, I ask. I never said it, says my father. You're putting words on the page on my behalf. That little box room where you used to sleep, like camping out as a boy. Oh, that was fun, he reminisces. Hooves and stars outside the canvas, cakes and ale within. Mm. So, um, moving on, thank you. Moving on from those, um, a few poems from my um, collection for Therese, St. Therese of Lisieux, who is um, a, a much loved saint um, who lived a very short life, uh, very well documented life in the late 19th century. She was um, a, a cloistered nun um, in the Normandy town of, of Lisieux, France, um, and she died at the age of 24, so a very short, compressed and intensely lived life um, with um, not only her own memoir and letters to draw on, but um, an amazing number of photographs um, for that time, most of them uh, taken by one of her own sisters, Céline, um, who was very artistically talented. She also joined the same convent. She took her photo, her, her camera with her, and um, we have her to thank for uh, some very moving photographs. So my project was partly um, a reflection on some of those photographs and partly um, a, an exploration of why I find her a figure that so catches at the heart. Um, it, um, yes, I suppose her, her littleness and her insignificance in some way has become such a powerful thing. Uh, I've ended up writing poems rather than um, uh, work in any other genre to try to understand her. I suppose that little compacted um, power of, of poetry drew me to explore her life um, in this way. So I'll read a few poems from this um, collection. And the first one is... Um, uh, actually drawn from a photograph um, taken in 1889 when she was a 16 year old novice. She is just 16 and clings to her pillar of faith, plump as a duck or a goose stuffed with buttery prayers. Papa delivers fish, wine, fur lined boots at the convent turn. And the sisters question after their silent supper how such a child could ever learn the art of suffering on her own. Mm. Mother scolds her when she drops her cloth, broom, fork, forgets to drop her gaze, rejoices at a play of light on Mary's statue. Therese kneels and kisses the floor. 
Even now, she's working on her heart's first draft, her young soul proven and rising like dough. And this is uh, another poem from the collection. It's called Tonsieur. Um, and hopefully it's self-explanatory as far as poems can be. The sisters said that at the monthly cropping of each nun's hair beneath wimple and veil, Therese would ask to be shorn on the crown like a monk or a priest. She would usually oblige her, whichever sister was tasked with the cutting. Then Therese would smile, smooth her hand over her scalp, a secret sign, talk back on, veil, cloak. She is a nun again. And yet, how happily she wore it, her hidden ordination, month after month, this renewal of vows, full like the moon in her tonsure of clouds. Mm. Mm. And moving on. Page 79. Okay, this is um, a reflection um, from a photograph taken by Teresa's sister the um, day after she died. Actually, it's a very beautiful photo, um, which, uh, uh, and the photos are available, um, finding them actually online um, uh, at the archive site of the um, convent of Lisieux was, was partly what propelled my, <laughs> my written responses. Um, Anyway, this is a photo taken in 1897 called Photo 46. October, it's over. Therese seems to sleep as though she has closed her eyes in final prayer, relaxing at last into God's arms. They have washed her and robed her, fastened her mantle with its wooden tibby, pressed the circlet of white roses over her veiled head wound the rosary about her hands, crucifix, lilies, the martyr's palm. Celine, perhaps, has gently smoothed the final pain away. She senses, as the camera makes its memorial, light and shadow silvering the glass, that something important is somehow beginning. And when they take Therese away, Celine feels her absence soft about the heart, like the dawn rivering through an unlocked gate. Mm. And um, one last um, poem for now from the, the collection. I mean, Therese, um, having died so young, um, it was thought that not much could be said about her after she died, but she had partly written her own memoir and that became published. And the response, to it was and remains quite extraordinary. And, and one of the um, indications of that early response were the letters, hundreds of letters um, that, that flowed, that flew um, into the convent um, from the beginning of the 20th century onwards. And uh, the image of these letters flying and fluttering in um, stayed with me. And so I wrote this poem, Letters. She comes to them in letters a few at first, like early leaves, cradled through the summer's turn, their paper ivory shy. I write to you because her death, they gather tidily in her desk. Then more fly in, little birds seeking shelter. You who knew her, say a little prayer for me. Then more with testimonies, pleas for intercession, relics, medals, something of her likeness. War comes, but still they flutter, missives from mud-spattered hearts, craving a little sweetness in the midst of dissolution. Her sisters sit in the garden, surrounded by breathing letters that settle in the grounds of grief's castle. She is the bud and stem of them all, as they settle like petals. Mm. So, <laughs> so, um, I'm, I'm losing count of how much time I've got. I've got a little bit more time. Do I, Mark, or shall I pass yeah, over? A couple more minutes, yeah, two minutes. A couple maybe. more minutes. Yeah, so um, I've been um, continuing to write in this strange, constricted year we've found ourselves in. Um, and um, 
I, I'm, I, I have got my theories that some poets have, have uh, coped and lived and addressed the situation by writing into it and others perhaps by writing away from it. And I suppose I've, I've kind of um, written away from it in a way, but I found my sense of um, poetry coming from a sense of uh, containment and enclosure, perhaps even more than before. So I've got a few more poems about um, Therese or drawing from Therese, written written in in, in, a, in a more condensed form, um, and then I've I've got some others as well, but maybe I won't have time for that tonight. But I'll read I'll read three from a, from a sort of subsequent project, um, which I suppose is addressing our constraints um, mm. in in the way I knew how. Anyway, so I, I haven't actually given them titles; they're just one, two, and three. One, <laughs> I have found God in the linen room within stiff folds of sarge and the tough pleats of bodies asked to bear their own spoiled fabric. I have raised the sheets in thin, cool air, aligned the corners, thumb to finger, stepped with arms outstretched like Mary visiting Elizabeth. So, Father, we are gathered up together in this transfigured chapel of the threads. Mm. And a little prose poem, and then another little verse poem, if I've got time. Mm -hmm. And this one's set in the kitchen. I peel back belief like the rings of an onion, brush covert tears with the back of one hand while clasping my knife in the other. The creeds and the councils are so many layers to prize and slide away. They drop like crescent moons into a bucket. The new living surface is soft to the touch. I unwind it nevertheless slip under the wrappings of language to something dearer still. I will cherish whatever is there, a white nub of nothing, an atom, a pearl, knowing it is good news, trusting it is gift. Mm. Um, and then I'm pushing my luck. <laughs> One, this is this is short. This, the, these are actually they're kind of written as letters. So that the father, the mon père, is is an imagined father, um, father confessor, um, and the voice I suppose is Therese, and it's partly me too, and all sorts of things. I offer you apologies, mon père, for today I have to write to you of nothing, the nothing life of penitence and prayer, the nothings of the recreation hall, where sometimes I have acted out my nothings to no critical acclaim. The nothing mornings when my head is as a void, the never ending trial of nothing ever comes, are not until belief has come to utter nothing will I start to understand. Mm. Um, and I think I'll step back there. <laughs> uh, oh, thank and thank you. you so much for letting me read. Thank you. Thank you so much, Sarah, um, for sharing from your published work and from these three short marvelous poems. I look forward to seeing them very, very soon. Thank you. So we turn from London, we cross the waters to Ireland, to West Cork, a place that many of you here today with us might have visited, and perhaps you're coming to us from Ireland. James Harper has published six collections of poetry, the most recent entitled The White Silhouette, He's a member of the Irish Academy of the Arts, a frequent contributor to various broadcasts, and we're delighted, James, that you're here to be with us from Ireland. Welcome. Thank you very much, Mark. Um, I see underneath my photograph the, the name of my partner, Evelyn. So, so it might be confusing people. Can you hear me? All right. Yes, you're yes, fine. Yeah. Great. Well, good evening to everyone and greetings from the west of Ireland. Um, it's lovely to be linking up with you in Camden. Um, I've only been to the US once in my life about 20 years ago to Alexandria and Virginia. And I had such a wonderful time there and received such warm hospitality that I'd love to come back to the States uh, in more propitious times. Mm. Um, I'd like to thank Mark for inviting me to be part of this event and also Meg for doing the arrangements. Um, I think it's great that there should be a poetry group in, in Camden. I think every, every town should have one. 
It, mm. uh, it reminds us that poetry uh, gives us a world of imagination and beauty, which gives a whole different perspective on life. So fair play to, to Meg and Catherine for founding your group. And I wish my local town, Clonakilty, had one as well. I suppose I should found it myself, but um, you know how it is. Um, I'm going to read four shortish poems. And the first one is about a secret woods in the west of England, in the county of Dorset, to be more precise. And um, my mother used to go to these woods every May to see the bluebells. And this is a sonnet called Cranbourne Woods, 17th of May. 1994. We stopped the car, ducked below the fence, felt time unraveling in a revelation. The seconds fall and scatter into thousands of tiny saints. Mm -hmm. A reborn multitude flowing past the trees through pools of sun. Each earthly form a spirit flame, pure blue. They watched us drift among them, large as gods, as if we'd come as part of their parousia to stay with them forever in these woods. As time grew darker, we slipped away like ghosts and slowly drove towards your death next May, when once again I saw the risen host, could watch you walking weightlessly among the welcomers, the gently swaying throng. Mm -hmm. Is that, uh, Mark, am I loud and clear and Perfect. Perfect. Okay, I can't tell from here. <laughs> I'd like to read a, another sonnet with an Irish flavour, and this one is about the saint uh, called Kevin. And according to tradition, uh, he used to pray with his arms stretched out and his palms facing upwards. And on one occasion, he was doing this for so long and so concentratedly that a blackbird laid one or two eggs <laughs> on his hand. <laughs> so this is called Kevin and the Blackbird. I never looked, but felt the spiky feet prickling my outstretched hand. Mm. I braced my bones, my heart glowed from the settling, feathered heat. And later from the laying of the eggs, heavy, as smooth and round as river rolled stones, warm as the sun that eased my back and legs. When I heard the cheepings, felt the rising nest of wings, the sudden space, the cool air flow across my fingers. I did not know the test had just begun. I could not bend my arms, but stood there stiff, as helpless as a scarecrow. Another prayer hatching in my palms. Love pinned me fast and I could not resist. Her ghostly nails were driven through each wrist. And the third of the four poems um, is set at harvest time in a pre-industrial era. And you have to imagine you're standing on the edge of a field watching harvesters doing their work. 
and then you see something strange, strange figures appearing. And the poem is based on a true story. It's called Angels and Harvesters. As thoughts arrive from God knows where, or sun breaks through a fraying cloud, emboldening a patch of trees or grass. They just appeared from nowhere among the harvesters, the field, the world of cutting, gathering, cutting, gathering. Their outlines sometimes flickering brighter. They walked between the bending figures, curious, pausing to watch, like ancestors almost remembering the world they'd left, or foreigners amused to see the same things done. Mm. They moved around unseen by all, unless one glimpsed, perhaps, light thicken, a glassy movement, as air can wobble on summer days. And then they went, walked into nothing, just left the world mm. without ceremony, unless it was the swish of scythes, the swish of scythes. Mm. Mm. And the, the last poem I'd like to read um, is a new poem and was inspired by a visit to the Cathedral of Chartres near Paris. I was there a couple of years ago and I'd just been reading about a visit there by the sculptor Roda and his friend and colleague Rilke, who Mark knows about all too well. Mm -hmm. And they visited there about 120 years ago in the winter. So this is called The Angel of Chartres. A fierce breeze tries to shove me back inside the train, but I resist and glide through sun-buffed literary streets, cathedral towers playing hide and seek as I turn a corner here, there, recording Rodin and Rilke arriving on a winter's day. Rodin abusing Chartres' gothic skulls. Rilke scoffed against the sleet of words, the east wind embittering his eyes and his life in flux, marriage flailing, and Rodin still relentless in his grousing until they turn the corner, I now turn. Mm. And all at once we see the angel, the slender angel low down on the wall, who's holding out an offering, a semicircle of stone, a sundial, dissolving time to a stick of shadow that's poised like a fishing float, poised to pull quicksilver life from flux, and if only for a moment, tear the spirit from the body and raise it high, shimmering and wriggling into the element of air. Mm. Thank you very much indeed, thank you. Thank you so much, James, from West Cork, Ireland, and, and from Shad. Marvelous. Thank, Thank you. you. You're welcome. Our third poet 
this evening, this afternoon, is a friend of James, and through Hilary Davies, James joins us today. Hilary Davies is uh, a British poet uh, joining us from London, across town from Sarah. She's published four collections of po poetry, all from Annie Tharman, the latest Exile and the Kingdom, from which she'll read this evening, this afternoon. Welcome, Hillary. Thank you very much. I'm going to read five poems, two shorter ones, and um, the last two slightly longer. I live uh, in a part of London which is very, very international. It's very multi-ethnic. I live amongst the largest community of Hasidim in Europe. Um, and one of the things that I've been thinking about um, very much is the importance of community during this time when we've all been, as it were, forced back into the communities where we live. This poem is not written um, during this latest pandemic. It was written earlier, but I think it sets uh, the tone for that. Morning comes to the city. Mm. Morning comes to the city. Heavy with dew on the autumn air, the gardens lift their wings and crackle a little. Sheds drip and the fox slides to his lair. My neighbour's boiler does the first toot of the day and the washing line's webs stream. Sideways and inwards, all our lives jumble into this tiny compass of making ends meet, making do, taking care, taking root, loving and struggling, and always the world revolving, no bigger than a man's thumb held against the moonlight, a world blue top hung in everlasting night. I'm very interested in the maritime tradition of my island. Um, the archipelago of islands defines very much my imagination. And a few years ago, I wrote a long sequence called Imperium based on the life of Nelson, though he's not actually mentioned in the poem. And it's an investigation into empire and the sea. He was born in a place called Burnham Thorpe in Norfolk, which is in East Anglia. It's a very flat part of Great Britain um, where the sea and the, the, the land interpenetrate. And this poem, it looks at how the sea connects us all around the uh, globe. I think you'll see that from the final reference that it has an American uh, connotation as well. Um, there are a couple of mentions of place names. Dogger is a sandbank off the east coast of England and Brancaster and Stiff Key are little ports near Burnham Thorpe where he was born. Norfolk, Burnham Thorpe, a web of water. Here, Vetch, Saxifridge and the Tourterelle cordon the land against it. Safe lines of linden trees, flint steeple, the backed up rectangles of stall, barn, forge, which demarcate certainty, the known interior, children raising their butterfly nets forever on the grass. At night only, first assuring at the edge of window pane, fainter than conches. It's not the feet of the mists over Dogger or this silk rain like a lover's hand, but the sound of something undertowing that draws us through the lens of every day onto the huge horizons. Open this window and hang into the stinging air. 
Far out, a kind of boom beyond the rise is more than storm, a sempiternal tug and flow, world heartbeat whose chords wrap round the oceans. Fair on a big white day of wind, the spit of land bordering blue and waves tall as houses. How high the heart too, bowling cartwheels down the dunes and racing veins of silver mud along the channels. Girl you, girl you, where do they come from? Cockle boats from Brancaster, quarries from Stiff Key, turn cambered between Arctic, Antarctic, strand walking here. Get in and keep the oars free of eelgrass. Move now plashing down runnels whose tides drive St. Lawrence, Hudson, Rio San Juan. I'm a French and German specialist uh, by training. I was a teacher of those languages for many years and I have spent all my summers um, for decades uh, in France, in the southwest of France, in beautiful limestone uh, gorges, rivers, spectacular landscapes, Paleolithic cave art. Um, this poem is called Fijac la Belle. Fijac is in the southwest, and one day my husband and I, in the summertime, they have music festivals, folk festivals, dancing. Uh, and we came upon one of these festivals, people playing music, and it, haunt, it haunted me for years. Um, and eventually this poem came to me almost, almost complete. Sometimes poems do that. And I wanted to try and create the, uh, not only the mood, but also the rhythm of what we heard. So I hope some of that comes across. Fijac la Belle. I remember a marketplace, O oh, Fijac la Belle. The bustle and laughter and summer cries, the little shimmering well. I remember a marketplace where we walked arm in arm, where branches danced and the river danced and lovers were free from harm. I remember a marketplace and how we stopped stock still. Over the breeze came music from a sudden haunting hill. Over the breeze came music. Five men sat in a row. Jackets of green and fiddles and gold flashed from their bow. Gold flashed from their teeth and eyes and black from their sleek hair and away from them flew their sound into the golden air. They bent their heads together and their feet tapped the floor. Their smile passed quick as a javelin as the sound began to soar. They struck the air together. Time and beat were one. The key and cord leapt asunder on the rarest of patterns spun. As their sound began to soar, it went into another land, and all the listeners hung on the thread thrown by their flashing hands. They bent their heads together, their feet tapped the floor. Round and round streamed the melodies out of the angel's store. The light grew long round the shadows as the song sprang to and fro and the lovers danced to hear the sound of the player's brimming bow. In the marketplace at Fijac, five fiddlers threw wide the door. Our hearts flew up into a golden tree and sit there evermore. Uh. Mm. Um, and I'm going to read two... Um, Poems. One of these is a very recent poem. Uh, my husband died uh, in 2014. One of the last things that he was able to do was attend a performance of one of his poems 
in the crypt of Canterbury Cathedral with attendant music. Um, and his daughters were there, his, and his son was there, his family were there. He was, um, the reason why it was in Canterbury is because he went to school there. So there are references to young people, himself, the, peop the, the school children who were reading his poem, that comes in. Um, and I hope that there are other references um, that you will get the, the, the sort of feel. This is part of a sequence on time that I'm writing about, um, and it's to do with the redemptive nature of time, I suppose. It's a little bit longer than the uh, previous two poems, so I hope you'll bear with me um, and that it makes sense as it hangs together. It's called Compass East, Canterbury. We travelled east, your youth's citadel. The arrow of the road points the end of summer. Atop the warm steps, the casual boys sling arms across shoulders for the photograph. Their gaze arrives at the little gaggle we make upon the grass. You are dying. At the held hand, your daughter's cheeks flush. This is how you will remember her. Mm. At the cornerstone, spirit takes the strain. The whole building rises upon it. Once there was nothing here but meadow. Now in the shadow, we hear you breathing, slow, marked. Your daughter is attuned as she never will be again to the in and out draw of how we leave life the wail of the broken embrace. This man in his agony sings who jousted with his fellows, the fair-haired gods gone under the ground. O oh, Salus Mea, at the edge of life where the singers pass, its colours sound back to us. The lyrebirds of wisdom spread their wings to hear the note. Tell my tongue of the sad glory of living, of the burning evenings and the dew on the hawthorn, mm -hmm. the rolling ball of the moon, the scent of the hedgerows at night. Young men and maidens lean heads together, meagre place where the sacred begins. How they stare to hear the song of the exercise of death, the discipleship, its desert sorrows. When men purpose a trench to raise their edifice in the wild fields, silence listens, under the stone floating, an angel's fingertip. Friends have gathered. Your daughter's eyes glitter in your presence like a gemmed casket. Mm. Love begets faith, and faith begets perception. We believe in the face of all the evidence and then find that the evidence has changed. This is not easy metaphysic, nothing to do with the philosophers of surface for whom the curtain of the instrument is all there is of real. Love's attentiveness quickens. Remember the little boy with no brain whose soul grew back miraculously? Love did this. Imperception is its own wall. Inert does as inert sees, never detects the tremor in the stone. Mm. The singers have arrived at the reach of darkness. They struggle with the difficult words. The lyrebirds stir and glance. Tell my tongue of when the human senses fail. At the utmost rim, love's longing rises upon the field of God. The mind intent, this sudden place shimmering and rushed with colour. Seed, flower and berry at one instant on the tree. Love's life fills in end and opening. The vessel dances in her disciplines before the gates of God. Thank you very much. I've run out of time, so I will stop there. Thank you very much, everybody, for listening.
Thank you. Thank you so much, Hillary, for taking us to such different places with such sensitive, tender insight and empathy. Thank you. Our final poet this evening comes to us from Oxford, where he teaches poetry, literature, and art history, actually. Uh, Edward Clark recently published a wonderful book entitled simply A Book of Psalms, 150 voicings of Edward's interaction with the Hebrew, ancient Hebrew Psalms, and with his own world, creating new Psalms that echo the ancient traditions in a very modern form. Edward also has published two collections of, of literary criticism, most recently, The Vagabond Spirit of Poetry. Edward, welcome to, uh, welcome to you from Oxford. Thank, thank you very much, Mark. Um, it's one, wonderful to be here. So th thanks also to you, Meg, um, for organizing all of this and, and for Rich for sorting out the technology. Um, I'd like to read to you um, a couple of poems from, from this recent book of mine, um, the book, a book of Psalms, and, and, then, and then move on to a couple of fresh pieces that seem to be forming part of a new collection. Um, so I'll begin with the, with, with, with the psalm poems first and perhaps elaborate on what Mark was saying. Perhaps I need a bit of an introduction. Uh, the, these poems are, are, are each in conversation with a, with, with a psalm in the Bible. There are 150 poems in the whole book. So I engage with the whole of the book of psalms during the course of my book. The poems are not, they're not translations or versifications. I suppose a few of them are quite close to the originals and are verging on that, but mostly they're conversations with the older texts, um, hesitations about them, um, but, but always, you know, transplantations, I, I feel, of, of, of the older work in, in, into my own life. Um, and so in that sense, you know, a very thoroughgoing and enge engagement with them. I really felt like the, the Book of Psalms brought well, actually brought me into a rather dark place, I suppose, in the middle, kind of initiatic cave, if you like, but, but, but a place from which I emerged, I felt, you know, um, singing praises, if, if you like. The, the poem I'd like to read first um, from, from the book engages with Psalm 67. Uh, I'd like to share this one um, because the book, the book was published on April Fool Day in the middle of lockdown. Um, uh, a, a, a kind of coincidence of, of events of almost biblical <laughs> uh, <laughs> um, power. Um, and, and I started leafing through the book, I suppose, it, it, you know, given our current situation, thinking about, thinking about my book in relationship to what we, we, we are still experiencing, and felt that I'd, I'd, I'd actually put myself into a kind of lockdown, I feel, for you know, the four or five years writing this book, at least in the early hours of the morning. Um, perhaps this poem has something to say about the condition we find ourselves in. So it's, I, I've called it, Let the People Praise You, O God. Psalm 67, what, one of David's Psalms. The ends of the earth are skeptical of lines beginning with the word God. Oh, how they hate to see an O oh or anything so bloody rhetorical. In fact, they'd rather go out shopping or clubbing, maybe get some food than read a poem at all. Or maybe they're packed inside a ship that moves into the dark and find they have to pray to something, their prayers beginning with God or O, oh, the ship abandoned to slip beneath the rainbow's thinning upon the swell, a kind of face in love that dies with praise mm. on its lip. Let the people praise you, O God. Let all the people praise you, someone sings at the top of a house, two hours a day, a self-regarding sweet enough old sod who doesn't seem to pray or sing, his praise adjusting words and things that sleep upright and nod. Mm. 
Uh, I suppose in the spirit of T.S. Eliot, I've made a kind of familiar compound ghost in that poem. Uh, I think of Eliot in Little Gidding and that mm. kind of Dante Yeats figure that, that greets him in, in the early hours. Um, my, my compound ghost in that final stanza is, is, is made up actually rather, rather um, strangely of, of Philip Larkin and, and, and Geoffrey mm. Hill. I can't believe they'd be a very happy compound ghost. So I don't think they would like each other very much at all. Um, but but there, there you go. I imagine them as sort of t tending, tending words as in an old, an old people's home. Um, I suppose I am worried in these poems about the kind of marginalization of, of poetry somewhat in our culture, but how, how also, um, you know, in, in these times, people seem to be turning to poetry suddenly and much more intensely that interest interested me, and I suppose in a sense poems about that. Um, the, this book began a, a, about five years ago after I'd spent a, a, a whole year rereading the King James Version of the Bible following the calendar of readings uh, in the front of the first edition, which I think is taken from the old Book of Common Prayer. That, that, that took me through most of the Bible. I had to kind of add revelation in. They weren't too keen on that in, in their calendar of readings. But it did involve me reading through the book of Psalms 12 times, um, because of course you work your way through it evening and morning and evening prayer every, every day um, during the course of a month. And, and, and it seemed natural, I suppose, uh, at the end of that, to, to be turning to the Psalms and, and wanting to, to, to somehow engage with them creatively. Um, you know, um, re remembering sort of B Blake's idea that the Old and New Testaments are the great code of art. Mm -hmm. um, and, and also, actually, perhaps even more radically in those, you know, annotations to his drawing of the Laocoon, you know, the, 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 the poet, the painter, the musician, you know, the architect, the man who is not one of these is not a Christian, you know, and understanding mm -hmm. perhaps that art has a central ro role to play in our engagement with the Bible. Um, so, I, 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 you know, in, in that spirit, I began translating Psalm 1 in rhyming couplets. Um, after that, very, very difficult, but, but kind of blessed experience, I, I stopped realizing I would, I would never make it through the whole book of Psalms like that, um, from 1 to 150. A year later, taking stock of my, my work, I realized I, I had been producing almost unconsciously poems that engaged with the Psalms. Um, and, and then started, I suppose, engaging with them in more earnest. And Mark, uh, you know, was very encouraging at this early stage and I, I think really uh, impelled me in, into making the whole book. Um, this, this poem uh, engages with Psalm 89. Um, the two parts I'll read from it um, are, are, are interesting in terms of the, the, the book being made because the first part comes from my almost unconscious engagement with the Psalms you know, towards the very beginning of the project. And the second part is actually the very last poem I wrote in the book. Um, the, the poem which is a kind of farewell to the book, if you like, when I realized I could make, could make no more changes to it that could improve it. Um, so the poem, poem is called Tondo. Not only your arms, but also your infant Christs have a kind of horizontal verticality that writhes around, wriggles behind reality. On knees of Neoplatonists, something that tests solidity. Face turned away, his arms are stretched out still in one tondo, posed as something purposefully spilt. His mother's face is tending to shadow like columns split into corners of a vestibule when a giant pulled it inside out. The barely containable solidity of a two-year-old, like an arm out of the Psalms or from the ground, when everyone at last is called, expresses the round of our lives in its entirety, our being bound and again unbound. This poem cannot be an excuse for it. My book of Psalms has been revised and yet again revised until I see I'm making no improvements. Despite my qualms, I'll stop 
My lines are now a source of pain and comfort too at times. No tinkering of mine can mend. And every retroactive fix, each verse I add that chimes the time of another's faults would just extend a book already longer than most would risk. I'll have to let it go like a son at school and turn away to get on with some other task while others coax and goad some meaning out of what it seems to say and trust it can rise to most of what they ask. There is no image for this other task imprinted on my soul inside the middle of the Psalms, where you bring forth for each intrepid reader your firstborn son. But I will keep at it like a man in love. So in, in, the, in the first part of that poem, I suppose, I'm thinking about my two-year-old firstborn son, Ludovico. Um, probably you know, very much in terms of um, Michelangelo's work, the Tade Tondo and the Royal Academy here in London, a wonderful round sculpture. Um, some drawings we have here in the Ashmolean that he made for the Last Judgment of, 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 in the Sistine Chapel, um, and, and also the Vestibule of the Laurentian Library. In, in the final part, um, my, my son has grown up. He's, he's a five-year-old. Um, there's a three-year gap in a way between those two poems, and, and the it, the poem comes out of my experience of you know, le leaving him at school on his, his first day at school just around the corner from, from where we live here, here in Oxford. Um, I was, um, uh, after finishing this book, after writing that poem, I, I had the good fortune of meeting Mark uh, in, in Oxford and having, having a pint with him in the Eagle and Child. Um, and and he, he was telling me that he appreciated the poems in this book that, that grew out of, I suppose, um, me, me thinking about my sons, um, and that, that provided me with wonderful impetus um, for, for new work, just as I was floundering after writing the, the Book of Psalms. And I suppose since, since we had that pint in the Eagle and Child, perhaps was that a year and a half, two years ago even now, I've been, been working on, a, on, 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 on poems that, that, that very much come out of my domestic life here, here in Oxford, but which are a kind of continued engagement with the Bible. The working title for this is is cherubims. Um, I use the, the old wrong looking plural um, to, to describe you know, for, for these creatures, which you find in, in the King James version of the Bible. Um, and I'd like to, to read a, a, a couple of poems from this book. So as I said, the, the poems very much engage with, you know, with my life here, but they're also a kind of meditation on those, those strange, fierce creatures in the Bible, those, those those angels that, that guard, you know, or keep the way of the tree of life at the, at the east of, of Eden um, that are represented, you know, above the Ark of the Covenant in, in the tent and in Solomon's temple. Um, the, 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 the figures, you know, the sphinx-like figures, John Golden Gay translates them wonderfully as sphinxes in his first testament, um, rather than cherubim, which is just a transliteration of the Hebrew. Um, you know, that the, the Ezekiel sees when he's in exile um, by the river. Um, and, and I believe these creatures also, you know, uh, recur at the end of the Bible in, in Revelation 2, Revelation 4. Um, I suppose I, I started thinking about them in terms of the pseudo Dionysus. And this, this poem perhaps comes out of that. It's a title poem, Cherubim. I contemplate this room and it looks a bloody mess the carpet strewn with bits of stuff and vacuumed fluff and my dried up mind that lies inside it, a flash flood which left its fullness on the walls as it departed, all our things sullied and redeposited. The beings that made this mess in their most high and eternal dance of excess of knowledge of God must think it odd I'm not so lifted up into the light of their kind of composite contemplation in super abundant elation since I contain in these walls what's most godlike. But then they do not think, as I pretend to do, when these words drink them in and are freed. They cannot read even the words set forth in Holy Scripture. They are so filled with light their minds are blind to what is on my mind, 
the landscape of its naturalistic picture. They are of the highest order and can but on the snowy ridge of that border participate and imitate as close to Christ as my two boys when they're tickled before bedtime and they behold as cherubims of old the face of your deepest radiance everywhere. Mm -hmm. I look for the text of their hymns so I might surpass these radiant cherubims but find the scroll is lost. The whole of it, they say, even a fabrication. But then the floorboards creak above. I hear a waking yawn and peer at a song hurriedly transcribed in elation. Mm -hmm. um, that's a poem I wrote um, in, in the room behind me where I'm sitting here in Oxford, which must have been in a, in a terrible state of disarray, um, probably three or four in the morning, the hours I write, I tend to get up at two or three and write, write until my boy, boy's, boy's awake. Um, so uh, I'd end with what, one more poem. Um, I wrote uh, the, at the beginning of this summer, um, I, visiting my parents um, across the Cotswolds in Cheltenham, I, I, I was listening to my two sons, um, Ludovico and, and his younger brother, Jacopo, telling stories to their grandparents. Um, and Jacopo wonderfully um, repeating his brother to, to, to augment details. Um, I, I read it because it, it's a poem that, that also, I suppose, has, has the Psalms in its sights still. So it's called The Idiom of the Psalms. I heard our eldest son relate an anecdote whose lines our youngest one would take and twist and quite exaggerate repeating this detail, changing that phrase, to share an effervescent tale whose parallel cola quite amazed the listeners they'd regale. The elders set a scene of heavy rain when, lo, the youngest said he'd seen big thunderstorms and conjured up clouds low on hills that fizzed and shook and darkness round the earth that billowed in the noise. The floods have lifted up their sound the floods lift up their voice. Can it be they're charmed spontaneously to raise the idiom of the Psalms? They seem to live like trees at the height of praise, these boys of mine. And when the story's over, play on cymbals and synthesizer, songs that sound as if their singers obey, a rule they'll break before long. Mm -hmm. uh, I'll end it there and, and, and hand things over to, to a discussion. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much, Edward. And uh, for those who may have joined us a little bit later, thank you, Sarah, for leading us off. Uh, James Harper from West Cork, Ireland, for following. Hilary Davies from Oxford, is, uh, from London as well. And now uh, Edward Clark from Oxford. Let me welcome the four of you briefly to reflect a little bit on this reading together, and we'll open it up then to the some 55 folk who've joined us for the reading. But first, uh, Sarah and James, Hillary, Edward, I welcome you to engage each other for a moment of conversation. I was very interested to, to hear um, especially in, in James's work, the the, the angels, um, mm. in 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 Chartres especially, mm. um, is that that's a real ang angel on the facade. I, t I take it. Mm -hmm. um, yes, it's a real one. It's a it's a carved stone angel, uh, unusually visible. It's not on the roof or tucked away it's it's quite low down on on the on the, the front wall towards the side and um Rhoda and Rilke both had a sort of a small epiphany when they spotted it and I was just actually had the book open that describes their epiphany when I turned the corner and there was the angel I was reading about staring at me <laughs> <laughs> so, well, 
you know us poets, you, we can never resist a little synchronicity. <laughs> and mm. it happened to chime with something that was uh, going on in my inner life. So, yeah, so that was the story of that. But um, angels seem to crop up in, in, I think, almost all the all the readings, if I, um, if I remember rightly. Mm -hmm. yeah. mm. Is that mm. right, Hilary? I think you have an angel tucked in there. Mind you, um, you, you are an angel anyway, so... <laughs> <laughs> Don't press your luck. <laughs> um, the lyrebirds, the lyrebirds are obviously beings from another, from another reality. I, I suppose in a way they are like, they are like spirit, spirits, like they're a, a kind of angel in so far as they're messengers. An angel, after all, is a messenger, is it not? You know, um, that's all. It, that's all angels are. They're messengers, and certainly, certainly, the lyre birds are some kind of messenger. Yeah, that's true. Yeah. Well, the beautiful poem you shared from the little village in the southwest of France, where exactly, we, were yeah. all, we were all almost caught up in the dance of the <laughs> of those of the poem. Uh, these were angels as well. These these fiddlers who appeared. Yeah, they were. They they arrived, They were there like an epiphany. And the whole, you know, how music transforms reality. And mm -hmm. it was as if everybody listening was spellbound by. And I thought I can never, never, you know, this is this is the moment comes, you know, that you, you catch the catch catch it as it flies. But um, but then the poem eventually did arrive and. It's, it's the best I could do. <laughs> yeah. Sarah, I wonder, could you show us one of the photographs from your book? That, uh... um, I willingly, yes. That, um, I'm not sure how well it will come over on uh, the um, camera, but there is a, a very young St. Therese, beautifully presented in this um, Paraclete press book. Um, mm. So that's Therese, age 16, and... Um, there are many others. I mean, I could, you know, I, I think there were 40, 47 um, in existence in total, mm -hmm. some um, Therese by herself and some uh, in a group. Um, this is one. Mm. Um, this is one of Therese aged 15. I believe it was the day before she entered the convent. It's her last mm -hmm. day out in the world. Um, and I found that very moving. Did you have these well. in front of you as you were writing as sort of a, a conversation? Partner? Yeah, some of them, some of them very much so, yes. So um, some of them I was familiar with uh, and some of them, once I once I'd sort of found the, archive, the online archives, uh, which have such beautiful photographic files, you can go through them and you can kind of dwell on them and you can dwell in them. I found I was sort of dwelling in them to a certain extent. So. Um, some of them I'm using more of a descriptive approach. Some I'm, I'm kind of trying to draw out my own reflections and, and further, um, uh, further narrative. Uh, so, um, so yes, very moving. I can see a question. Why is Therese a saint? What are her special gifts or good works? What a great question, <laughs> because in a way there's a sort of, absence of what we would what we would perhaps call the traditionally grand heroic gestures or the amazing miracles during her life um, instead there is something that is quite hard to put in language so of course I'm immediately attracted to uh, trying to explore it but um, a, a very very intense um, moving I suppose self-giving um, tied to her uh, her own abilities as a writer actually I mean she, she wrote mm. she wrote in the form of late 19th century um, spiritual parameters and so sometimes her writing can seem a little bit uh, s sweet to us but uh, other times very, very much not actually and mm. she towards the very end of her life um, where she's dealing not not only with sort of uh, traditional Catholic pieties but with a, a very real sense of desolation actually mm -hmm. um, something that has been you know, subsequently explored in a lot of literature, 20th century and so on. Um, yeah, considered mystic, maybe. Yes, there are arguments 
um, both ways. I mean, she didn't have visions. She didn't have visions. And, well, maybe she had a few short visions, but she wasn't, her life wasn't characterised by visions in the way that another Teresa, Saint Teresa of Avila uh, was. Um, but that, to me, makes her seem all the more contemporary, actually, that, mm -hmm. that she, she has uh, more in common with, with um, just the ostensible normality uh, and the ostensible anxieties and constrictions of, of contemporary life, perhaps especially <laughs> 21st century, 2020 um, mm -hmm. contemporary life. Mm -hmm. but, but there we are. I wanted to say, actually, just uh, 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 to the side of that, how, how much I enjoyed all the other readings and how I particularly enjoyed the, the kind of intersection of, of place. There seems to be such a beautiful celebration of place. You know, Norfolk, I'm mm. a Norfolk girl, actually. I was born in Norwich, so um, I sort of, I know the stories about Nelson well and the, and the, the, huh. the, the, the particular uh, sort of ethos of the place, but all over the place in, in, in Europe and so on. And then sort of bisected by our own interests, whether that's biblical or, or, or or biographical or um you know other other literary and cultural context but it just it just felt like a really great reading you know drawing in all those contextual aspects oh, thank you yeah yeah there was a question about the role of poets in in ireland and in the uk what is there something distinctive and and james i wonder if if you might reflect a moment with us about that ireland certainly has uh, an immense tradition, bardic tradition of poets, which I, a couple of times in, during my visits in Ireland, I found myself in pubs. Where else do you go uh, if you're in a village? And at some point in the evening, people began to sing, um, invariably. Uh, not with a radio, but maybe somebody had a fiddle and suddenly they were singing and there was po poetry reciting and is that normal in Ireland, James? Um, I think it's it's fairly normal, Mark. It's it's beginning to fade slightly with uh, social media and all those other um, erosive uh, modern uh, trends. But um, certainly in the, in the less developed counties like Roscommon, Leitrim, there is a great uh, bardic tradition of um, people learning long ballads off by heart uh, and the ballads would reflect um, historical and folklore uh, material and they can recite at great length in a, in a way that I you know it would be almost the, not quite as long as the ancient mariner but be in that kind of order of things and it's very enviable for someone who's being brought up on a literary culture uh, such as myself, uh, I seem to have a no memory whatsoever <laughs> for, for poetry. You know, um, can barely remember you know, my own poems. I'm doing well if I remember the titles, but these these fellows in the pubs they can go forever with a few drinks in them. Yeah. Um, and it might be the the resemblance to song because for some reason people mm. can remember song better than than words mm. and i think ballads have that and in fact i was struck yeah. by uh, uh, hillary's poem which had, had the the ballad form as far as i could tell the uh, mm -hmm. fijac la belle if i pronounced it correctly mom mm. yes yeah. yes <laughs> you have fijac yeah thank you mm. <laughs> mm. yeah so yeah, it's very much a tradition that carries on, Mark. But uh, obviously, the, the the later the generation, I think, the more the erosion of um, of memory. Um, the I mean, it, I find it quite scary the, the whole internet thing. And um, there's a wonderful book by an American author called The Shadows, which. Uh, which the author argues that all we have to do is remember our password and that opens up. We can outsource our memory to um, Wikipedia mm. and all sorts of things. And that we're actually eroding our short-term memory physiologically. Mm. But that's all I'll say on it. Mm. Thank you. Thank you. Edward, I wonder if you could chime in here because you... You teach writing, you teach poetry, you teach the arts, and now you're doing it all by Zoom, 
what's that been like? Does that change the form of teaching, the form of engaging poetry? Um, it certainly widened the, 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 the audience, the studentship. Um, I feel that you can actually do quite a lot of what you were already doing on, on, on these platforms, but one does miss the physical presence mm. of, of, of people in the classroom. Um, I, I find it a bit unnerving after a while talking to a kind of void or wall of initials um, mm -hmm. or, 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 you know, or, or small faces. Mm -hmm. um, I, 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 interesting, very, very interesting in, in the function of memory, you know, and, and poetry, because memory is the mother of, of the muses. Um, in my own work, um, I, I find I, my, my poems, I find if I don't remember a poem that I'm writing, then the poem's no good. And that, and that often I am composing in my head and from memory in the first stages. Mm -hmm. Interestingly, I've sort of tried to cultivate mm -hmm. that, that part of my mind um, mm -hmm. or have found that part of my mind cultivated in the process of writing. Mm -hmm. um, at least it gives me something to do sometimes, you know, um, well, 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 when I don't have pen or paper to, to hand. And, and also just thinking about sort of Yeats's idea that, 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 that folk art is the soil in which all great art is rooted. You know, and, you know, mm -hmm. and that seems to me so, so true. My, my book of Psalms is written very much in that spirit, trying to root, root my own work back, back into it to get some kind of sustenance in, in the world in, in, in which we live today. I mean, I see it not only in Yeats, you know, who famously went around collecting old, old ballads, yeah. Lady Gregory, but but also you know Bob Dylan, uh, I, you know I think the only, the only reason he's so good is is because he, he you know he spent so long b banging out you know old, old songs from memory in 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 the cafes of, of Greenwich Village in the early sixties. Mm, um, so that's yeah. that's something I've been very keen to explore actually. But both those things, I suppose, traditional art, which 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 has everything to do with memory. And yeah. Then, no, I would, I, I, I would agree with that. I think you, you return. I've certainly found I'm become much, much more interested in folk traditions, having had a very literary, you know, very you know, sort of classic high, high, high art education. And I'm, I now, I now am very much interested in precisely as you describe, you know, all those fiddlers that I, you know, tried to evoke. And and other and other similar things. Um, yeah, it's 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 an inter it's it's almost like going back into the ground somehow. It's grounded, mm -hmm. grounding yourself. Yeah, Hilary, I wonder this new collection. And thank you for sharing such a magnificent poem. Remembering that scene with your late husband at Canterbury. Time. What what has this whole COVID experience done to your shape? to shape the way you think about time in that book and beyond? Interestingly, the only, th the, I mean, I rather resisted, rather as Sarah was saying, you know, people either went towards it or they ran away from it. And I, 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 I certainly resisted kind of writing what I might call my COVID experience poems. But, um, but one of the things that did happen to me during it, being deprived of certain things, made me very, very aware of our physicality, our incarnate nature in every sense, you know, the spiritual sense, in the sense of being with our friends, in the sense of moving around place again. And that made me think a great deal about time, of course, time and space deeply linked. And I've written poems about the modern linkage between time and space. Um, and I'm trying to look at different models of time, you know, the arrow of time, space time, seasonal time, cosmic time, different kinds of models to see how, um, how much I think they, they help us to live in this world and be human beings in this world. And some I think are very destructive, like the arrow of time, and others of course are, are not, they're redemptive. So those are the kinds of things I'm looking at. And, and the, uh, the thing about COVID, I suppose, would be that it, it forced me to be even more aware of, of um, how, how time needs to be redemptive rather than just forced upon us in some kind of horrid clock mm -hmm. time way. 
Yeah. 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 I noticed a, a, a question came, thank you, from Howard Engelskirchen about a conversation, perhaps because conversation has been so significantly interrupted for us mm -hmm. in ways we're used to gathering with friends, meeting people in public spaces, the intimacy of engaging in a face-to-face -face conversation. I find <coughs> myself now in the, the one expression of teaching, I'm teaching with a mask on my face and all of my yeah. students are sitting with masks. Horrid. Our experience. Horrid. Horrid. But, but, how do we create conversation in, in such times as these? How do we maintain that essential part of our humanness, which is engaging each other in the word that binds us, connects us, frees us? James, let me turn to you first. Um, this might sound very banal, but I think the telephone is a very good way of doing it. Um, it bec it's become a forgotten art, the telephone, because of text and email and Zoom and Skype. But you get a pure connection simply through through voice and ear. And I think that's a, a wonderful way of communicating. And, you know, there isn't really a middleman. Uh, there isn't mm. distortion or, uh, uh, or tricky Zoom codes you have to click on you know it's, <laughs> it's right there so um i recommend the telephone that would be my mm. my response to that mm. i'm not sure if that's what you were you were angling yeah. for Mark, but it's an uh, open question really just a wondering about how we maintain conversation in times like this uh, sarah yes it's a good question um especially as Yes, I mean, I'm, I teach as well, and, and uh, I was teaching quite a bit online anyway, but my, um, all, all of my teaching is now using various Zoom-like uh, um, software and so on, and, and a lot of the stuff is recorded as well, and, and it, it, to me that kind of tilts it over into a slightly more formal framework, whereas my experience as, as um, sort of teaching and learning and you know other other circumstances is often it's the it's the incidental moments it's the it's the kind of mm. liminal moments the transitional or water cooler mm. moments <laughs> you like to call it where you can really make some connections and ideas can spark and there's a there's a there's a freedom there and that's quite hard to replicate yeah. um, with our boxed in schedules um, and I don't really have a um, a solution to that apart from just to be available really you know i try to i try to show my human face <laughs> sort of in between um mm -hmm. teaching chunks i i try to make an effort to respond to emails and so on but um mm -hmm. uh that that is hard isn't it that 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 sort mm -hmm. of dynamic that's not uh that's not scheduled that's not planned that's not formative mm -hmm. or summative or assessed in in some way um but that is serendipitous um, mm. And it feels like, you know, because now, now student, students read a lot of stuff from online libraries and so on, which is great. I mean, the, you know, the OU online library is absolutely fantastic and other places I teach at. But you lose the serendipity of, of happening yeah. upon things. Yeah. And it feels like the same now is taking place with our, our, our sort of social connections and um, thinking about how to, how to rectify that or how to, how to modify that is, is mm. something I'm still puzzling over. Mm. Yeah. Mm. Thank you. Yeah. Hilary, Edward, conversation. Well, I think of the it's quite a large valency of meaning in conversation. It can it can be just the way you are in, in your life with, with others. It's the way you live your life, isn't it? I think it would have had that, you know, if you go back to Milton, the word the word has, you know, a, a large, a large range of meanings. And ultimately it just means to turn your to turn oneself about. So it's, it's a word that's fascinated me for a long time. Creatively, I've, I've created works out of conversations with older texts, you know, in the spirit of early modern practices and imitation, et cetera. I found though just recently, it's kind of extraordinary in the sense, because I'm, I'm you know, I live in Oxford with two small children. You know, my, my, my children are four, four and seven at the moment. Um, and I think, I think Hilary mentioned, you know, what one becomes much more conversant with one's neighbors you know, and, and one's immediate local community. So that's intensified for me. Our, our neighbors have children the same age, three girls, you know, so and we kind of share gardens. So there's been an intensification in that kind of conversation. Mm. Um, but at the same time, 
that's, you know, that struck through with me crawling up to my study and having conversations with 18 people from all around the world, you mm -hmm. know, um, right, right in the middle of that kind of chaos. I, I might, might have my four-year-old sc screaming up to me, you know, while, while I'm talking to people in Singapore, you know, so, so I, and I feel that there's kind of extraordinary, you know, opportunity in that as much as, much as it's also a bit disconcerting. <laughs> Um, but yeah, I mean, obviously I miss all the, the physical things too. Mm. Yeah. Uh, I'm reminded that the, the word in its medieval usage, conversatio, meant a way of living. Not yeah, just a way, quite. It was a way yeah. of being together, really. That's right. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I mean, because co conversations are uh, have a, a whole load of different dimensions. They're not just the exchange of words. No, um, it's everything yeah. from sex to Socratic dialogue, really, isn't it? <laughs> mm, indeed. Mm. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. Mm. James, Kevin, Kevin has been haunting you for some years, this image of Kevin and the blackbird. Mm. Is this something that you discovered as a child? But the the story or the story, yeah. When did you first find the story? It's a marvelous image story of the saint. Yeah, I'm, I can't remember when I first came across it. I, 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 I in one of my books, I did a, a sequence on um, stories of the saints, Irish Irish saints, I should say. Uh, and there's a very rich tra tradition of uh, hundreds of saints in Ireland. Um, we have one near us called Gubnet, for example, who uh, was a, a woman who repelled enemies by using uh, bees, which she used to stir up and aim at, her, at attackers. Mm -hmm. And I suppose I'm, one of my interests is, is, is that the imagination should have no possible boundaries. And mm -hmm. I found that the stories of the saints, although at a rational level, at a materialistic level, tend to be thought of as being impossible. But nevertheless, they are fantastic parables and embodiments of the imagination. Mm. Um, for example, there's a, a saint whose name I can't remember who sailed across the sea or a lake on a stone which miraculously didn't sink. And, <laughs> and Columba, St. Columba, or Columkill, um, he picked a white stone out of a river and blessed it, and anyone who touched it was healed. And the local pagan king called Brood, Pictic, Pictish king, refused to believe that God had uh, engineered this miracle. And he commanded Columba to throw the stone into the river. And he did. And it bobbed up, quote, like an apple. Uh, so uh, it's these stories that, are, that have fascinated me and which uh, struck a deep chord with regard to my, my worldview, mm. uh, which is based on the, on the imagination and its boundless. Mm. Uh, thank you so much. Yeah, and the point, the, the, the interesting thing about miracles um, is also miracles are all around us. You won't see a miracle if you don't want to see a miracle. As if I, 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 this, I actually have quoted Diderot, who in other respects I rather like. He's rather a fond philosopher, but he's, he's quoted as saying, I wouldn't believe a miracle even if I saw one. And that <laughs> sums it up. Yeah, that you yeah. won't, therefore. You know, it won't happen. You've said yeah. it. You've done it, man. You, you've had your miracle and you, and you didn't see it. Um, yeah. So, you know, the, the, the wise man sees not the same tree as the fool sees. It, it's, it's all of those kind of old cliches, if you like, or old sores. They're, they're trying to say the same thing, I think. And uh, I've always been interested in James's fascination with miracles because, you know, what people have a very strange idea of what a miracle is. They think it's, you know, it's some kind of, some kind of Star Wars arriving unannounced in your room, you know, pow. It's, it's not that at all. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> well, it's um, been a marvelous evening together and I know we're really imposing on your um, 
longevity, all of you, uh, in a much <laughs> later time zone than ours. But I'd like to thank each of you for making this a truly remarkable evening together, afternoon together. Sarah Law from London, along with Hilary Davies from London, James Harper from H-A-R-P-U-R uh, from West Cork, Ireland, and Edward Clark from Oxford. Uh, the books of these people are readily available at your favorite bookstore if it's still open, and certainly from online vendors. And I hope you'll find an occasion to support them and their work. The poets keep the imagination, the flame of the imagination going. And I'm reminded of the first two lines of one of my favorite poems by the bard from Amherst, Massachusetts, who really never left her house and yeah. to garden a little bit, but she never saw much of the world, but she did through the imagination. She saw the world in ways that have etched themselves on our minds through the last 150 years, oh. as are your words now. But in one of those poems, the first two lines tell all the truth, but tell it slant. Success in circuit lies. <laughs> That's a marvelous, marvelous way of capturing, I think, what you've each done. You've shared the truth with us, slanted through your own experience, slanted through your wonderings and your worries, your joys and your anxieties. And you've given us a fl flicker of light to keep us going in the dark. So we join all of us in thanking each of you for this chorus of uh, witness and for such beauty in such remarkably distinctive forms. Thank you, and Thank I'll you. turn it back over to Meg and Catherine. Meg? You're... Meg? Would you like to say a word or Catherine? You're, you're muted. Okay. I just thought this was an extraordinary couple of hours. Very moving and very, uh, for me, thought provoking. That's sort of a banal way of saying it, but um, inspiring. And um, and I can imagine picking up your books, all of them, and reading them. And thank you so much for that. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Catherine. Thank you. Meg, a final word from you? Yes, thank you. I wasn't allowed to unmute myself and not my usual experience. <laughs> thank you all. This was just amazing. As Catherine said, it was really an exceptional evening. I was inspired. I was moved. I was enlightened in different ways. There were things I hadn't thought about or wasn't familiar with that I, you know, just want to know more, hear more, um, read more of each of your poems. So really, thank you for being here tonight. And thank you so much, much Mark, for bringing everybody together and for a really interesting conversation afterwards about angels and conversations and all different kinds of things. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much for organizing um, this evening to you and Mark and and uh, and really good to read with James and Sarah and Edward. Thank you. And thank you, Rich, or myself. I mean, no, I want yeah. to say thank you, Rich, for organizing this all. Yes, thanks, Rich, for all the technology background and backup and support. Thanks. Yes, thank you, Rich, so for that. And thank you to everybody who came. And we mm -hmm. indeed. Poets Corner is in a month, Meg? Yep, November 8th, and with Kevin Pilkington and four other wonderful poets. So please come back. So you'll get an announcement if you've been here tonight reminding you of that event, and I look forward to seeing you then, if not before. So thank you so much, all, and good night. 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 Bye bye.